The meeting of the Tuesday, March 26th, Carmel Clay School Board set is now in session. Please, um, Madam Secretary, roll call. Everyone is present and counted for. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Next up, we have the presentation portion of the meeting to recognize our outstanding seniors with perfect ACT scores. Dr. Ferris. Dr. Beresford, member of the boards, it is my pleasure to be here tonight uh, on behalf of Carmel High School staff to recognize a very special group of nine students. We are here to recognize our students who have earned a perfect, perfect ACT score. While their scores define their success on this one test, we are proud of all of their accomplishments. We know that they are more than a number to us. They are greyhounds who make daily contributions to our school community. We are thankful for each of these students on a daily basis and know again that they contribute much more than just a score on one particular day. So on behalf of Carmel High School, our entire staff, uh, we congratulate each of you. Uh, I know several of them are not here this evening, and at this time, I'm going to invite our Director of Counseling, uh, Mrs. Rachel Cole, to come forward, and she will present these individuals. Okay, I, I'm going to say the name, and then if you'd come up, and uh, Mrs. Beresford and um, Dr. Ferris to present, and then I'll go to the next person. Okay. First student is Sai Shreeton Gudapati. Claire He, Kevin Hugh. This isn't going so well so far, people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, Mikola, no, Nicholas Mikola. Um, Bargava Mortha. Matthew Harabashi, Danya Patongi, Paris Punotter. Thank you, Paris. student, Karthik Varagonda.
Next up, we usually have public comment, but no one has signed up this evening for public comment. So after that, on the agenda, we have consent. And as we've explained in, in some of our previous meetings, our consent agenda is the section of our meeting where we have our routine items that we need to approve. Tonight, they are personnel report, claims, payroll, gift applications, and then our board minutes from our January 8th, January 22nd, and February 5th school board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the consent item? Um, I think the meeting dates are incorrect. Oh, they are not correct. Making sure here. It's the 12th and the 26th. Okay. Yeah. Apologies. So our meeting, for the meeting minutes, we're going to approve the meeting minutes. So the personnel report, claims, payroll, gift applications, and then board minutes from the February 12th and February 26th board meeting. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, we will now vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries. We are going to move on to our action items. And our first action item is the new course proposal. And then we have Dr. Dudley. Thank you. So this evening, I'm bringing to the board for a recommendation to approve um, the new course proposal that we discussed at our meeting um, last in March or in February um, and this is the um, the course is 5968 business marketing and entrepreneurship and this course as I explained in our February meeting this is a course that we actually um, have this is a modification to the course and it's changing the numbering of the course so that the students can take both this course concurrently with the other marketing and business courses and these are for our students that work um, and do work on our Carmel Cafe. They're, they actually manage the Carmel Cafe. And so they take this course in the um, fall semester, and then they take both fall and spring semester as the management piece. And this is um, that they already have the course, but this is the new numbering that the state has, has used. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the new course proposal? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Our next action item is a bid award for the Carmel High School existing natatorium re-roof. Mr. McMichael. Thank you. As you noted, this is a bid award for the high school natatorium uh, um, I'd share that the uh, bid did come in right at the estimate. I mean, like within a thousand dollars. So they, they were good, but not that good. So, um, but we were very pleased that um, that we were that close to the estimate, and certainly that we were not over the estimate. So. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the bid award for the Carmel High School existing natatorium re-roof? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Thank you for that. And just to be clear again, this is the existing auditorium, not the new one. That's exactly right. And this was building. by design. We waited uh, until later to, um, to re-roof that section. Okay. Thank you. We'll take a vote now. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Our next action item is the change orders for the Carmel High School Natatorium addition and existing natatorium renovations. Again, Mr. McMichael. A little technical difficulty here. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> okay, so the first one is uh, uh, an ad change order for to General Piping Inc. in the amount of twenty seven or twenty three thousand sixty seven dollars. And we'd recommend your approval on that. And um, here's the detail. Uh, small piece of this is back charge, but uh, most of it has to do with labor and materials required to install and add some additional ductwork in various rooms. And then, are you taking these as a group? Yes. Did you say? Or no? Yes, this one is the there, natatorium addition and the existing natatorium renovation. Yes, I'm on five. the 5 3 one. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is the one that's oh, to uh, general piping in the amount of $23,067. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we're good. All right. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the change orders for the Carmel High School Natatorium addition and existing natatorium renovations? So moved. May I have a second? second. Any discussion? All right, no discussion. We'll take a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. We have another action item up next. It is the 2025-2026 and 2026-2027 Carmel Clay Schools calendars. And this is Dr. Ostrike. Good evening, President Coquet, Dr. Bearsford, and members of the board. I recommend that the board approve the 25-26 and the 26-27 <coughs> district calendars as presented at the March 11th, 2024 meeting. Um, once again, as a reminder, next year's calendar does not change. That remains the same. These is two years in advance that we're approving this, these calendars for our community. And as a reminder, um, we uh, surveyed uh, over 4,000 of our parents, teachers, and community members uh, on uh, their feedback for the calendar. We gathered all that feedback to present the calendars as we shared last uh, meeting. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. May I have a motion to approve the 2526 and 2627 calendars? So moved. And a second? And then any discussion from the board? Katie. I wasn't here to hear your presentation. Um, I did read, a, read it and everything. I, so I, mine is more of a comment. I just want to thank you for continuing to let our parents and our staff um, to provide input, especially since this was our first week that we had the week-long fall break. Um, and then the results were overwhelmingly um, parents 72% in favor and staff 82%. So I think that that's great that we had the option for them to, to give that feedback if it worked or not and what they wanted projected for the next year. I also really like that we are ending um, towards the end of May. And I know we had to do some wiggle room along with that and stuff too, but I think that that's really great that they'll kind of get at least two full months before they come back in August. So just again, thank you for you and your team's work on this and for getting the input from our families. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, also, on the same line, I heard a lot of positive feedback in the community about the May end. And so, and I'm sure it's a huge feat to do such a large sampling study, but um, I think it's really good for people and it lets them have, feel more invested in the process. So thank you very much to you and your team. Thank you. All right, we will now take a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for that. Our next action item is the Carmel Clay Public Library appointments. Dr. Beresford. Yeah, the Carmel Clay School Board of Trustees has one appointment on the Carmel Pub Clay Public Library Board uh, that is uh, expiring as proposed. I uh, met with uh, Mr. Swaney, the director of the Carmel Clay Public Library, and, uh, um, and I shared that with you all, that he um, really um, recommends the reappointment of Ms. Stephanie Kim. She currently serves on the library's board as the vice president, and uh, the appointment would be effective July 1st of 2024 and will be scheduled to end on June 30th of 2028. So it's recommended to the board to approve the reappointment of Ms. Stephanie King Kim to the Carmel Public School Library Board. The four-year term will expire on, in 2028, as I said. So that's the recommendation. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the Carmel K Clay Public Library Board appointment? May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. <clears throat> and the last action item we have this evening is the resolution to authorize litigation against social media companies. Dr. Beresford. Yes, we discussed this a little bit, but uh, the Carmel Clay Schools um, 
um, is going to join other school systems in Indiana across the country in what's called a multi-district litigation. And uh, much like the Juul litigation that we were involved with um, due to the vaping crisis, uh, this one is to hold social media companies accountable uh, for what I would, we would describe as deceptive practices that target kids. Uh, these practices re result in addictive behaviors in students and other related mental health issues, uh, which uniquely impacts our students, our schools, and our families. So uh, it's recommended the board approve the resolution authorizing litigation against social media companies. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the resolution authorizing litigation against social media companies? May I have a second? <laughs> Any discussion? Um, I just want uh, just a general comment. Um, I think that social media can do a lot of good, and I think it has done a lot of good. I think what we're drilling down to is the fact that they're, they're like I think I love the, how you use the phrase deceptive practices, specifically for minor children. So I think that that's something where um, that's really what we're digging into. That like we're acknowledging the fact that there's good parts of it, but we're also, there's things that it's attacking, and we're seeing the results of that in our children today. Yeah, I would add to that, that what we're looking at here has um, some statements from the Surgeon General of the United States. It's, it's very serious. Um, it's not to say that there's, uh, like Katie said, there are some, some good things, positive things about it, but uh, there's some very dangerous things, and, and I think that uh, there was a, a letter written by the Surgeon General, I think last May, uh, to the public at large warning us about that warning points about these, these problems. And I think this is a, a case that I'm really glad that, that we're being a part of. And I think we need to send a message to these developers that have made um, algorithms that have you know, chased some nefarious things against our children and caused the damage, the suicides and other things. I think we're not going after it because of the uh, potential money that could be won in the case. It's, it's more the uh, protecting the children and uh, We will take a vote on this now. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Next up, we have the reports section of our agenda and uh, before that starts, I just wanted to remind the audience here tonight that, um, you know, we, they have spent a bunch of time, quite a lot of time, putting these together, and so we need to be respectful uh, and listening to these reports as they are presented. Thank you. Uh, up first, we have a staff and student services report, Dr. Ostrike. Good evening once again. For tonight's staff and student uh, services report, I've invited Gary Clevenger Director of Transportation for Carmel Clay Schools. I've shared through previous reports some of the recruiting we've done and attracting bus drivers, um, but Gary has put together a much more in-depth present presentation that just focuses on transportation, and I'm very much looking forward to him sharing this with all of you tonight as well as the community. So without further ado, Mr. Clevenger. Thank you, Dr. Ostrike, and thank you, President Coquet, Dr. Beresford, members of the board. For the opportunity to speak to you tonight, uh, forgive me if I'm a little little stuffy. I uh, you usually you'll find me in a polo and maybe a safety orange vest directing buses, <laughs> so I'm a little out of my element this afternoon. But uh, uh, did want to go ahead and give you kind of a state of transportation, a bit of an update on where we're at staffing wise, some of the challenges that we've faced, uh, but also celebrate some of the victories that you may not uh, may not have noticed unless you were looking at this data the way that I do every day. So I wanted to share it with you. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, our transportation department transports, we provide uh, above 25,000 student transports every day. When we talk about a student transport, that's any time a student gets on the bus, they go to a location, they get off the bus. So uh, when you calculate that times 180 school days, that's uh, roughly four and a half million student transports performed every school year. And then what I like to put here is uh, safely. And that's really the qualifier that, that needs to be emphasize here. If you think about any time you do something four and a half million times, uh, think about the, the opportunity for error 
um, it, it's a phenomenal achievement what our drivers accomplish every year, and it's because we are very selective about who we choose to be at Carmel Clay School's school bus driver. So that community really, uh, they really shine, and they don't necessarily always get the credit they deserve, but uh, hopefully you all will join me in, in celebrating those achievements. Um, in terms of our driving, you can see here, every given day our fleet of buses are out on the road. We're driving a little less than 5,000 miles every day, well over a million miles driven every school year. So we are on the road and we are definitely, uh, we're rolling. Every day we have roughly 700 routes that we are running. So it's a combination of our AMs, our PMs, our middays, uh, extra, our, our early childhood uh, runs that we're running. So you can see here a breakdown. I, I won't go into to every bullet point here, but you can see a breakdown of, of where those occur. Obviously the largest number are our elementary routes. And you can see here, I do want to draw attention to the 14 double routes. Um, and a double route, uh, for those who are not familiar, is a bus goes and they get a group of students and they usually get them a little earlier than, than they normally would. They bring them to the school. There's staff there at the school to receive them. They then drop those students. They go back out. They run another route and then they bring those back on time with all the other buses. So it is a very efficient way of utilizing one driver to do two routes, but it does require some, uh, you know, some pain points as far as there's a group getting up early, and then in the afternoon there's a group staying at the school late. Um, so uh, it's not the ideal way we want to transport our kiddos. But you can see, you know, 14 sounds like a lot, but when you consider in 21 and 22 we were double that, um, that's a number that I do, I look at and celebrate. I do want to see that number continue to go down, and that's our, our continued effort and our continued focus. But um, we, are, we are making progress. Just to draw a little bit of attention to the number of drivers listed here, we have 126 full-time drivers, and um, we say here, ideally, we'd like to have between 150 and 160. That ideal number is if we wanted to um, eliminate our no-bus zones completely, if we wanted to eliminate all of those double routes that currently exist, we would need an additional roughly 30 uh, drivers. Um, a lot of people say, well, do we have enough buses? The buses are really not the problem. I need the, I need the professional behind the wheel that can do this job. And um, you know, we don't just want somebody who can fog up a mirror. We want somebody who has the right heart for it. We want somebody who has the right focus for it. So, and you can see that's broken down even further. We have. Uh, we have a very innovative concept in our teacher drivers, and that's worked out phenomenally for us. Um, we've got seven elementary teachers who also drive a school bus for us. It's a really cool gig for them. It's a really neat experience for us because they come in with their student management understanding is, is you know, beyond compare. They come in and they just need to learn how to drive the vehicle. The students, they see them every day. They've got a built-in rapport. Um, but unfortunately, all they can do for us, they can do elementary routes, because these are all elementary teachers, then they got to go in the building and teach. Then they can come back in the afternoon, they take all those kiddos home. So we get limited use out of them, but we do love the fact that we have those resources available. We have uh, 18 drivers that are on kind of a 50-50 job share. Uh, our average age, and I know I have a slide that gets to this, but our average age of our driver is roughly 65. So we have a lot of retirees from other fields. A lot of uh, professionals in, in various industries that have chosen to do this in their retirement, and we love that they have. Um, but it also means that we get them for a shorter period of time, because eventually they want to really retire. Like, they want to do an actual retirement and go and do something fun and not wake up at, you know, five in the morning. And, uh, and we don't blame them. But uh, what that does mean is a lot of drivers will slowly kind of phase out, and they'll go from being a full-time driver to, oh, maybe I'll drive the morning, and I'll find a partner to drive the afternoons or I'll drive one week and then my partner will drive the next week and we'll do a week on, week off. So we are very, very creative and very flexible in terms of what we will work with. I've got, uh, I've got subs, you can see here 28 sub drivers of varying availability and when I say varying, I mean, you know, they are, uh, you know, we have some that are AM only, some that are PM only, some that are, you know, one week on, one week off, some that are snowbirds. We have some that are available every third, you know, Tuesday of the month as long as it's a waxing crescent of the moon. And, I mean, so we're, we're very flexible. We'll work with anybody. We really want to, uh, we've leveraged coaches as well to get them trained. So we are, um, we're definitely looking at all availability. And then I wanted to celebrate this as well. And I'm going to celebrate the fact that this slide is wrong because it says six drivers in training. The actual number is five. And you say, Gary, that's less than six. Why are you celebrating? Because one of them got their license and became a driver. So we were very excited about that. Yeah. 
So we do have uh, a new driver who just started this week and he's completed his certification process. So we are very happy to have Greg on board and driving his routes and he's been doing very well. The other thing I want to draw attention to is our, our process for becoming a school bus driver. And I know that we say this a lot, and I know Dr. O has, has, has mentioned this a lot, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's more than just expressing interest, applying for the job, getting hired. There's a lot to it. So I, I don't know that I necessarily want to go over every bullet point, but I do want to just highlight for you this step number one. All of this has to be done before that person could ever come inside our doors and get on a bus and start learning how to drive it. So they need to apply for us, they, we do an interview, and then at that point there's a whole bunch of federally mandated requirements that have to take place. So um, they have to go to the BMV, they take four written exams, they take those as many times as they need to until they pass them, and then at that point they have to come here, we will send them for a pre-employment drug screen, we will send them for a DOT physical, and there's actually a couple of different physicals they have to complete, as you can see here, um, and it's pretty rigorous. There's background checks, there's enhanced background checks, enhanced DCS checks, there's an enhanced BMV screen that we have to do. We don't want anybody who has a, a crazy driving record. So they go through a lot of, uh, of checks and they go through a lot of, um, kind of under a microscope and, and rightly so because we want our drivers to be the best of the best and we want to make sure that they are here for the right reasons, for the protection of our kiddos. So. After they've done all of these things, then they finally can go to the BMV, they can turn in their paperwork, and they can say, hey, I'm going to get a permit. And now that I've got my permit, that lets me sit on a school bus with a qualified driver trainer and drive it on the road. But I can't have any students on board. This is just learning how to drive the vehicle. Then next, we actually begin our, tra our, our paid CDL training program. So it's approximately four to six weeks. It's about 54 hours. And I love our training program, and I'll brag about it to anybody. They are paired one-on-one -on -one with a driver trainer. Our first-time pass rate for our trainees that go down to do their CDL test is in the high 90th percentile, 97.5% roughly, which is it's unheard of. I mean, we are, uh, you know, knock on wood, we're very, very good at what we do. Our trainers are very good at what they do, and we're mindful of the fact that we're not going to send a, a candidate down to test until they're ready and until we feel that they're ready. So we will never, uh, we'll never shortchange anybody's training. We'll never uh, rush it. And then they can also work for us as a bus aide during route times if they're available, which is, has been a great thing. It's a great way for them to learn about student management. Um, and it's also a great way for us to get those covered because, you know, we're also having difficulty finding bus aides that want to ride along on the buses as well. So, you know, just like a lot of the, the position shortages that we've seen, um, but our bus driver shortage has been an enduring uh, shortage that we've been dealing with for, for years now. So, um, so after this is all completed, they've got their CDL completed, they've got their license in their hand, uh, they've now completed all of those requirements and they can legally drive that vehicle, but they can't drive it with kids yet. So that brings us to step three. Step three is the certification program. So they get a license, or I'm sorry, a certificate through the state of Indiana and start working towards what's called their yellow card. You need a license and a yellow card in your hands to be able to drive a school bus with children on board. So they go through a large uh, uh, curriculum of training and they must do minimum hours of observation, minimum hours of driving time in order to meet um, the requirements of the state and federal government. And then at that point, once we feel that they are qualified, once we've had them drive with several different drivers who can mark off that they've completed these requirements, then uh, they have obtained their yellow card and they are certified to drive our kiddos. So if that sounded like a lot, it's because it is. It's a lot. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of talk nationwide about, man, you know, it, it would be really helpful if we could make these requirements less stringent or if we could um, take some of these, some, some of the red tape out of this and take some of these requirements and throw them out. Um, I, I would love for this to be a faster process, but I can't find any of these things that I would be willing to sacrifice from a safety standpoint. You don't want um, drivers who have had less than what they're getting here, and you don't want drivers who have had less than, than what we give them here at Carmel Clay Schools. This is, uh, this is the best of the best that we're putting on the road, and you know, we'll, we'll stand behind the, the folks that we have. But it does mean that it's, selective. it's a selective group, it's a short group, so we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we're trying to get more people to join our crew. We would love to, to have more people on board. Um,
but I will never, um, you know, sugarcoat it for them. I do want them to know what they're stepping into. Okay. Just to show you our progress, when you look at these resignation numbers and you kind of look at them compared to drivers hired, uh, this is another area where I'd say, you know, this actually, when I see the behind, behind the scenes of this, this is a success story. So you look down here, I want to draw your attention to the very bottom bullet point, 45 driver resignations in, in the 2021 school year. Uh, there was an event that happened around 2021 that we all remember, um, and it did lead to quite a, a bit of, of um, driver resignations during that time. Um, and you can see during that same year hiring-wise, uh, we definitely didn't make up any ground. About 33% we were able to, to make back up or rehire. But over time, what I'm very, very proud about is that resignation number, knock on wood, has continued a decline, and that hiring number has continued an incline. So I'm, I'm very positive about uh, our future as far as continuing to attract new drivers. Um, but, you know, it also is, is definitely dragged down in terms of, of the number that we've lost over time. So we don't, uh, we're still kind of digging our way out of that hole, and we're just now getting to the point that we're starting to, uh, starting to, to break even. So the thing that I like to stress to people, and I always stress this to my team as well, because I think it's really important for their morale. If you judge um, our progress by, you know, do we have every driver we could possibly need and beyond, um, then you would say, oh, well, we're not there yet. But if you judge our progress and the hard work of the team by our ability to stay even um, with all of those losses, with all of those resignations that have come through, um, that I think in itself is a pretty tremendous feat. And I do, I, I, my, my team has done a remarkable job um, processing these, and we've worked very tirelessly with the HR team getting these processed through. So we're, uh, we're, we're good buddies with our HR team getting things processed. And it's, it's been a lot of work, um, you know, and sometimes it's uh, just staying even doesn't seem like a huge accomplishment. But when you know what happened behind the scenes to make it do that, um, I think it is. So just to give a little bit of information, I know some folks have asked about compensation. Um, we are actually one of the highest paid uh, school bus driver, as we have the highest paid school bus drivers, uh, at least one of, in the, in the kind of greater Indiana or central Indiana area uh, in Hamilton County as well. So we pay roughly 175 to 180 a day, uh, roughly five and a half hours a day. So you can see the breakdown there hourly. Um, like we said, our average driver age is roughly 65, which means that insurance in the past has not really been a, a big priority for them. Uh, the surveys we've always sent out to our staff have indicated that the vast majority of them want to see that uh, all of that money put towards compensation. They want to get that money in their check. So that's kind of where we've targeted our, our focus. And you can see, you know, the reason we, we haven't necessarily gotten all the drivers we're hoping we get is because, like we said, it's a very selective job has a very selective schedule. Not everybody wants to wake up uh, at 4.30, 5 in the morning, depending on where you live. And not everybody wants to come here and drive a 40-foot vehicle around a roundabout with 60 kids behind you, and you're back to them. I mean, it's, uh, I, I get it. I know I'm selling it really well. Um, but it is, uh, it's a tremendous job. And if you talk to any bus drivers, um, they will tell you how much they love it and how much they love getting to meet the kids every day and how much they love getting to kind of live vicariously through these kiddos and they tell them about their experiences and all the firsts they had that day and did you know this? And it's like, well, yeah, I did, but I, I, you know, it's neat that you didn't and you got to learn about it today. So it's a, it's a really cool process and it's a really neat, uh, rewarding job. And so, um, you know, if you're worried about the vehicle, don't be. You know, Dr. Beresford always says, you can, if you can drive an SUV around a roundabout, you can drive one of our school buses. Um, maybe not as fast as some of those SUVs I've seen going around the roundabouts. But we do, uh, you know, we will we'll get anybody trained, even if you've never seen a school bus in your life. Uh, you probably have, but uh, we can get you behind the wheel, get you rolling, and, uh, and very comfortable with these vehicles. If anybody's ever interested, you just want to stop by the office, talk a little bit, I can take you out, we can get you out in the parking lot, have you take it for a spin. So if the vehicle is what's worrying you, please don't let it be. Um, but again, we want the commitment to be somebody who is looking out for the safety and well-being of our students. So no bus zones. Um, obviously in 21-22, we had to make some very, uh, very difficult decisions about how we were going to deal with the uh, pretty drastic driver shortage that we had. 
among our strategies was the implementation of a, a no bus zone, which was roughly a one mile radius around each school building. Or each school building. Um, I say roughly because it's not necessarily a perfect circle. We took into account um, you know, large thoroughfares, dangerous streets that shouldn't be crossed, those types of things. So um, those were implemented along with the three-tier bell system. So we went from a two-tier system to three-tier to maximize the number of routes each driver could drive. Uh, and then we also implemented things like double routes, which we've talked about before. Our no-bus zones include about 10% of our students, so roughly 1,500 uh, students or so, um, that would have been eligible for transportation with the implementation of the no-bus zones were, were taken out of that eligibility. Um, and this just allows us to ensure that the most number of students uh, that we have, that we can provide transportation for, are getting it reliably and timely. And I think that's important. That's the, a distinction in our strategy versus maybe some other school districts uh, near us who have had similar issues, but, um, you know, not to fault them, but they chose to kind of ride it out and then they would handle it as situations presented themselves. The problem with that is when they present themselves, you have to react very quickly and sometimes that reaction is, we can't have school today. We have to go to a virtual day. Or, hey, uh, we just, we, we can't pick any of these folks up. Or, hey, you know, um, your kids aren't getting home until nine o'clock at night. Or, we're gonna put them on a, uh, you know, a, a city transit bus and there might be a transfer from a transit bus to a school bus or vice versa. So there's a lot of, uh, of different options there. We felt that this was the most proactive way that would ensure the most number of students would have access to reliable transportation. We also work with the city and the city was phenomenal in working with us to get uh, crosswalks put in place, get crossing guards put in place, uh, more infrastructure such as the, the flashing light crossings. Those have been really great and they, uh, they had those available and implemented very, very quickly. So we, we really appreciate our relationship with the city. We've also been asked about things like uh, bus location apps. There's a few vendors out there that have these apps. Um, just to give some context about how, how well Carmel Clay Schools does with our school buses. So those 700 routes I mentioned that we run daily, on average, uh, less than 1% of those run late. So less than seven of those routes every day would run late. Um, which is, which is phenomenal. I mean, still, you know, you don't want to have seven running late, but uh, numbers-wise, that's pretty good. Uh, families are notified if we have a bus running any more than 10 minutes late. We use our school messenger system to send out a text, to send out an email to our families and let them know. Um, but those, uh, those apps do kind of require an infrastructure that, uh, that does have a cost to it. And so it, uh, it plays on a, a live GPS system that has to be incorporated in every school bus. And it's a, uh, it's a cost per bus for an entire fleet. And then this is more of a front-facing, user-facing um, feature that would be available for it. So um, we are, I know Emily Bauer and I have been working on some communication features and we're looking at some other things that can maybe phase out. Uh, we've previously used Twitter slash X as a way to notify if we're running late or a bus has changed, but we're not quite the 10 minutes late yet. Um, but we're looking at some other solutions that will help us to, to get that word out um, without having to use you know, some sort of external social media site. So. And then looking to the future. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about you know, what I see as success stories, but at the end of the day, it, it does mean that there are certain students that we are not currently transporting. Um, and it means that there are certain students who are being transported either early or late. Um, my little third grader at Prairie Trace is on a double route as well, so I, uh, I, I complain to myself quite a bit. But, um, you know, we do want to get to a point that we can eliminate those double routes. We do want to get to a point that we can gradually shrink some of those no bus zones and potentially look at those, uh, we, we look at those boundaries every year to see if there are any areas of improvement we could make, any new hazards that have arisen. Um, and parents bring those to our attention. We say, okay, well, there's construction in this area or there's no more sidewalk um, in this area and it's adjacent to an unsafe, you know, unsafe uh, piece of geography. Who knows what's going on? Um, but we do take that into account and we work pretty heavily with the city, with the street department, with the engineering department. Um, so we try to stay abreast of, of what's going on within the city. Um, but really, uh, at this point, there's no way that I could commit to us being able to eliminate our no bus zones anytime soon. Um, they're going to continue to be a reality here in Carmel Clay Schools, um, but we will continue to review those and see how we can decrease those numbers 
Um, but really, in order to get there, we would have to hit that 150 to 160 mark, but not just that. Because let's say we had a phenomenal hiring you know, burst and suddenly everybody's excited and we get up to 150. Well, you also saw the resignation numbers and you saw that we gain and we lose and we gain and we lose. And so uh, what we have to be very careful with is, oh, we finally got to 150. We're at 151. Let's do it. Let's call it all off. And then we have eight resignations the next day and now we've got to pull it all back. So um, while I know it's not... Uh, as uh, it's not a pleasant thing to, to not have a school bus, and I do sympathize with that. Um, our goal remains trying to keep it consistent, trying to keep it reliable. And we want you to know what you're going to get. And if you have a bus, we want to know that it's going to be there, and it's going to be there in a timely manner. And if anybody's interested, we are hiring. So feel free to scan the QR code. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Send me an email. Um, we would love to talk to you about driving a school bus. We'd love to, if you want to talk to your school bus driver, you want to talk to uh, any of our school bus drivers, I'm sure they will tell you uh, all about the job and, and how, uh, how exciting and rewarding it is. So with that, thank you for, my, for your time. I'm surprised this didn't shock me. All right, thanks everybody. Any questions or comments? Louise. Gary, before you leave. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for that thorough report out. I appreciate that. Um, I just had a couple points, questions. Um, I am excited about the continued rigor we use to train drivers and assess their competency. I think we might need some of that for school board members. Um, but... <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> I also like that I can see attrition going down. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I had is what do we, what can we do? What's the number one contributor um, to that number continuing to decline and retention improving? You know, I think um, the other thing that kind of wasn't included in that data is a lot of that hiring uh I think a lot of it has been our flexibility. So what that story doesn't tell is, um, you know, the, the great hiring uh, strides that we've made. Um, some of them are full-time. Some of them are folks that can do AM only, PM only. So uh, it's not, you know, it's not a complete apples to apples. Uh, what I can say is those 45 that we lost in 2021, that was, that was a gut punch because those were all, those were mainly full-time drivers. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been, our, our flexibility, I think, has drawn a lot of people in, and we've kind of helped them maybe dip a toe in the water and, and see that it, it is something they like and they want to, to you know, take more of that on. Um, but also it just means that there's, there's that much more work to do and that many more hires that we need to do to bring those folks on. So as far as attrition, I think it's just been making sure that we recognize. Um, we had a, 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 a kind of a banner... Um, pay year, I believe it was 21, 22, when we uh, made some changes to their compensation that was was pretty significant. And that, uh, I know that made quite a few of our drivers happy and they felt acknowledged for the, the additional tier that they were taking on and the additional work that they were going to be doing. Um, and I think that's drawn a lot of folks as well. We've also gotten more uh, already licensed CDL drivers than we ever have. Um, half of the 16 that I've hired so far this year were existing CDL holders that came from other school districts. So I think that's another thing that maybe we, we hadn't uh, done as, as so much in the past. We definitely were more bringing in our own people, training them from the ground up, but I think we're, we're starting to be seen maybe as more of a destination location where other drivers are coming. So that's been, that's been nice to see as well. If I could add just one thing to the compensation piece. The same time we, the, uh, the resignations declined was the same time that we uh, went to the three-tier three system, so it occurs to me that um, uh, that now the job pays, uh, and as Gary said, we 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 st we very gradually moved ourselves into these double routes and so forth and things like that. So, um, but with the three-tier system, the pay is fifty dollars a day more. And, and remember, they're coming in mm -hmm. to work twice a day, so it's like. Once you're here, if you stay another half hour, you make fifty dollars more. So that also then um, makes the annual salary here um, 
higher and therefore there are fewer jobs that you can go to and make more money and work 180 days and those kind of things. Now, if you can't deal with children, it won't matter what we pay you. But, but, but so I, I, I think that the job is, looks a little more like a full-time job. And for some people, um, you know, they'll keep this job as opposed to, and maybe not need to work as many days uh, for that annual salary. Um, and, and we don't know if that's contributing, but, but we, we just from driver's conversation, I mean, they, um, any number of them, they, they, uh, they would really prefer to do what they're doing, get additional money, because they're coming to work twice anyhow, so they, they stay a little longer around when they arrive. Okay, so your opinion is, if we were able to offer full-time compensation, it would. No, I'm saying that right now at the at the uh, 170 or 80 dollars a day times 180 days, um, that competes with some otherwise year-round jobs, and and so if you're in a situation where that that you can manage making that, and you're not need, if you make, need to make twice that much money, this isn't the job for you. But if that works for you, um, it, it looks a lot more. It looks more like closer, move more toward full-time pay in terms of an annual salary as compared to a part-time job. And so I think there may be less, some people would be less likely to leave because we do lose some drivers because they they take a job that pays more money. They work longer, but they need to make more money, whatever, and their circumstances change. So for those drivers, there's some of those that are able to stay here because they're now making more money. And then I think probably 20 or so drivers, maybe more, also work another job mm -hmm. for us, like in food service. And so now they combine the two, um, still 180 days, uh, but they're already here. So they, instead of going home for a few hours, they go work in food service, make some more money. Um, and so it, they have a way to, we have choices for them where they can um, kind of have some choice in terms of how much, how much they work and therefore how much money they can make. And as Gary said, we're much more flexible than we used to be when we had lots of applicants because we take you, you know, part time, half time, full time. Yeah. So I think I hear you saying we've increased the pay by fifty dollars. We talked about that, and there's some opportunities to make additional pay, but it go it gets down to being able to compensate at a higher level. That might help with yeah. retention and the flexibility. I think and the that flexibility this job offers that you as mentioned. well. Just yeah. being able to come in and, like Roger said, you can still make a, you know getting closer to a full-time wage, yeah. but you also have the middle of your day free, and you know, mm -hmm. you're know you coming in for a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it's attractive for a lot of people, especially folks who can kind of make their own schedules or you know have, have other things that are a little more flexible. Okay, okay. And then I think, Dr. B, you probably could speak to this, but I've, you know, I'm one of those parents that I, through the years, was pretty frustrated about um, high school starting, um, or high school getting out after elementary, wanting my older kids to be there when my younger kids, you know, got off the bus so that I could work my full-time job. Can you just remind the public of why that is not an option for us or why we've chosen to go a different direction? I'll throw a big vocabulary word down here, circadian rhythm. But uh, there's just a boatload of research that uh, adolescents um, operate on a later time schedule. And... Uh, and so the, the, the research is just overwhelming that uh, really elementary kids do better earlier, uh, and then middle school and high school kids do better. Really, uh, most research says that after 8.30, and anything between 8.30 and 9 o'clock would be optimal. And so uh, um, they're just on a different, a different time schedule at that, at that point of development in their, in their lives. So that's, what the, that's a brief on a lot of research. Thank you. Katie? Um, first of all, can we clap for you and your team again? Because I am so thankful for all of the things. And please express that to them, how incredibly thankful we are. And they are the unsung heroes of Carmel Clay School. So, so much appreciation. Um, I had the privilege to go to a drive the bus event. Um, so I have taken a lap in a school bus. Um, I don't know if I will take any more, but um, it really is. Like, I love those events. I love all the different outreach that you guys have done. Um, I do think it's definitely more intimidating until you actually do it. Um, I love that you guys are doing those different out, outreach types of events. Um, thank you for um, 
Mr. McMichael for hitting on the fact that um, if a employee wants full-time benefits, that they have another option. I know we have quite a few who take um, us up on that. And Dr. O, do you want to speak on that at all? Did we cover it? Yeah, with regards to working a couple jobs and then if like they... they can work in the, like, the food service or something else yes, in addition. Yes, then they would be eligible for benefits with both of those jobs combined. Perfect. Yes. Um, and then my last question for you is, I know there's a lot of talk about stop arm safety and all of that kind of thing. Could you just touch a little bit about like, what do we see here? I know we have a great relationship with the police department. Could you, could you just touch a little bit on that and maybe remind people about what they should be doing? Yes. So that is my, that's my little passion project, so I appreciate the question. Um, in addition to my role here, I sit on the executive board of the School Transportation Association of Indiana, and I'm a director at large there, and that's been kind of my, my project ongoing. Um, we do, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, well, stop arm violations, uh, when the big red stop sign comes out on the school bus, the expectation is that the vehicles who are traveling uh, in the same direction as the bus or traveling against it are stopping. I know, it's, uh, it, it sounds simple, but it does not always get adhered to. Um, we have a very good relationship with Carmel Police Department. Actually, Hamilton County in general is very fortunate in that uh, most of the law enforcement entities and the courts will issue citations to drivers based on either a self-report from the, the bus driver themselves with a uh, plate number and uh, vehicle description, or we also, uh, more and more of our vehicles are equipped with stop arm cameras, and so the cameras are angled in a way that will capture the license plate of the vehicle as it's blowing by the stop arm. Um, and they will actually issue citations based on that. Um, I came from a previous school district in Marion County, uh, and Marion County will not do it unless an officer has witnessed that violation occur. Marion County will not be able to do anything with it. And primarily it's because, you know, the officers are not going to issue any citations because uh, the prosecutor's office won't, won't take those. And there's, there's different schools of thought, and, and we're definitely working on uh, all of the county prosecutors around the state to, to try and get them more comfortable and reproduce what we do here in Hamilton County um, and, and why you know, our, our attorneys, why our, our prosecutors feel it's defensible, why it's a, that it's good practice. Um, ultimately, nobody wants anybody to blow by a stop arm. Nobody wants any students to get injured when they're crossing or getting on and off of a school bus. It's not, a, it's not particularly a political topic. It's, um, it's the best, best interest of our students and its safety. Um, every April, in late April, so I believe it's the 21st that we have coming up this school year. Um, every school district around the country does a single day stop arm violation count. And so that's coming up and we record uh, how many violations occurred. Every driver has a form they complete. Uh, they record, was it in their same lane of travel? Was it oncoming? They record, was it um, on the left side? Was it on their driver's side or was it on their door side? They record, other details about it, what time of day it was. And so then we report all of that data to the State Department of Education, and they send it and uh, compile it nationally. Uh, last year, Carmel Clay Schools had 61 uh, stop arm violations in a single day. And I can tell you, um, it's, it's more than that. Um, it's not tremendously more than that. We had a very good report out um, from our drivers. But I think folks would be pretty astonished by how often that happens. Um, one of the things that we obviously do to combat that is all of our drivers are trained to understand that very likely most times they're the only professional driver on the road. Uh, everybody else, the last time they learned about what they were supposed to do when they see a school bus was when they were 16 and they were taking driver's ed. Um, and so we tell them to act accordingly. We tell, I train them to assume that the general motoring public around you is going to make a mistake. They're going to do something unsafe. And so position your bus accordingly. Position your stops accordingly. Uh, if you see something, say something. If you have areas where people are driving quickly, those are areas we really you know, need to look at. Should we have kids crossing those streets? So we're very, very judicious about what streets we allow students to cross. Um, you know, we're very uh, particular about taking driver feedback into account and reviewing those things. Um, our relationship with CPD and especially with our, with our, our SROs has been very helpful in, in, in helping us to try and curb those. Um, but ultimately, the, the general motoring, motoring public, is they're, they're, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to have their phone in their hand. They're not going to be paying attention. And so what we're trying to do is just take a defensive position on it. 
we want to make sure that we are positioning ourselves in the, in the best possible position that our kids are going to be safe. We want to teach our kiddos safe crossing practices. If you're inside a neighborhood and you're crossing a street, you may not see a car in sight, but we still want you to get off the bus, go out far enough that the driver could see you, you can see them, you make eye contact, the driver gives you a signal that it's okay to cross after they've checked their mirrors, made sure nobody's coming. Um, in the mornings when they're coming to the bus, same thing, they're waiting until the driver's checked to make sure everything's safe, then they're motion informed to cross. And that's just, a, that's a relationship building thing, that's a rapport thing over time. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, any of, any of uh, the district administration will tell you I'm a realist, um, so I'm, I, I tend to, you know, be a safety guy, so I'm worst case scenario. So uh, I know, you know, this doesn't necessarily give you the warm and fuzzies when I, I tell you that we do have stop arm violations, they do occur. But um, our drivers are very realistic about them as well. And so we position ourselves defensively for the safety of our kids, and that's our primary concern. Um, if they want to continue to violate our stop arm, it's going to make us very upset. We're going to catch it on camera. They're going to get a ticket in the mail, but nobody's going to get hurt. Thank you. Craig? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you very much. Uh, that's excellent presentation. I uh, had an opportunity last year to go on a couple of the expedition tours and I rode on the buses and that was always fun, uh, probably more fun than when I was a kid. But uh, One of them was electric. I remember talking to you about that and yep. there was some lessons learned. Uh, why don't you give us an update on that? Yeah. So uh, we were the first school district in the state of Indiana to get an electric bus in June of 2020. We got a Bluebird uh, 84 passenger transit bus, so a flat nose bus, just like most of the buses that you see out on the, uh, on the streets of Carmel. Um, and it has been, we were, uh, it, there is such a thing as the bleeding edge of technology. We were fortunate enough, though, to get the vast majority of that purchase funded through the Volkswagen emissions grants. Um, so it was 75 to 80 percent of it that was funded through that. So what our, our portion of it that we paid was, was significantly less than we would have paid for a, a comparable diesel equipped uh, transit bus. Um, and, you know, it's, it is, um, the primary issues that you have with it are, are, are the primary issues you'll hear about any electric vehicle currently. It's range. If you're comparing apples to apples, if you're comparing this to a, a 100 gallon diesel tank on a, an 84 passenger diesel bus, um, you know, that bus might be able to go 400, 450 miles. Uh, the electric bus is, you know, even if we're on the highway, would maybe be able to go 150, 200. So it's, it's not there yet. The technology is not there yet for it to compete. Um, it's not a situation where we would advise retro, you know, taking our entire fleet and replacing it with electric buses today. Just don't think that technology is there yet. I'm definitely curious the, to see what kind of strides they've made in the four years since we got our first unit. I would love to, uh, to take a look at another unit, but um, the only way I would do that is if it were similarly subsidized the way that our first one was, because uh, it's if, if uh, out of pocket one of those buses is roughly five hundred thousand um, dollars, and for context, uh, a comparable diesel equipped bus is two hundred thousand, which still makes me shudder a bit because when I started in transportation ten years ago, they were under a hundred thousand. So tells you how inflation's been going. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it, I, I definitely don't want to knock it too much. It's a, it's a pretty neat, neat technology, um, and it definitely has, I, I would say, if that technology can improve, uh, it's the best possible use case for it, because school bus uh, stops, school bus routes are start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, and if you know anything about combustion or compression engines, uh, they don't like that. So if an electric bus could get to the point that we could have similar range uh, reliability things, if we could get to a point that infrastructure was built in, uh, that we could take it on a trip to Chicago or any of those things, and we wouldn't, you know, we could stop and charge it for a similar amount of time where we would stop and fuel up a bus, that'd be great. But we're just, we're not there yet. So I think it's been a neat lesson learned, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that it, it, it still has room for improvement. And, and Cummins and Bluebird have been a really good partner in it. They've retrofit uh, quite a few things on it for us just to, you know, to get our feedback. And so they're constantly asking us questions about how it does, how it performed with this. Cold weather performance was another area that it didn't do as well in. And so um, we're just very, we're very cautious about the times that we will use it. Um, but it is fun to drive. And the drivers who we have trained to, to drive it do really enjoy it. Um, it's very quiet. I joke that you should put a Bluetooth speaker on the on the front of it that sounds like an engine revving, because otherwise it will it will sneak up behind you like a golf cart. 
car. Yeah, so I, I believe we, uh, when we buy buses now, we expect to have like a 12-year length of service. Yes, we, we're required to have a five-year plan for replacement, but the short answer is yeah. It used to be 10 years ago, and for quite a while it's been 12. Um, and we, we are looking at the possibility of, of keeping them a little bit longer than that, depending on you know, new technology and safety features. Years ago, um, there's been a lot of improvements in terms of the safety of the vehicle itself, as there has been with cars. But, um, but typically, it's 12, on a 12-year cycle. But we're not, the technology is not at a point where we'd want to start phasing them in at this time, it sounds like. Well, the other thing I should the mention. The electric bus? Yeah. 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 No. We, have a, we have kind of a, a middle technology that I, I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, we have 31 propane-powered buses as well. And so that's a technology that all of our, uh, well, the vast majority of our special needs buses are more mid-sized buses that have wheelchair lifts equipped on them. All of them, for the most part, have been transitioned over to propane fuel. And it uh, very low emissions, uh, very very low emissions, and uh, range is fairly comparable to that of diesel. And so that's been an area that we've seen a lot of success in. And actually, this year, this coming year, I think we'll finally be on a full uh, life cycle of a bus. So we'll finally we'll have had propane buses for 12 years, and so we can actually give you know real world boots on the ground analysis of what our experience has been like with those. And we've had a very good record with those. So that's been. It's been a nice way to still meet some of those emissions uh, standards and help uh, our kiddos breathe cleaner air, but also still have the performance that we have been used to. It, just one last question. So we did mention on one of the charts that the ideal staffing level is 150 to 160, and we're, we're still short about 25 or so. Um, <clears throat> are, we, are we fully budgeted for that? It's just merely trying to find the right people? or uh, Well... The short answer is no, we're not fully budgeted for that if we just went from one day to the next. One of the things we did, as I alluded to earlier, was uh, when, as we got shorter and shorter on drivers and went to three-tier routes, then we also are paying more than we did. So um, we're not in a financially in a situation where we could, you know, just add more drivers with more expense. So if, because we don't get any more money, you know, the state tells us how much we're going to get. So. So uh, uh, and so we're aware of that, but like for example, the we significantly increased the pay for that third route from what we started with years ago. Um, but if we had enough drivers and we didn't, you know, we went back to the two tier system, then again the bad news would be they would make less money. First, they'd be driving less, but likely it, it, it'd be a challenge to maintain even the even like an. They don't get paid by the hour, but if they did, um, we'd have to consider that uh, because there is a financial element to all of this too. But we don't think that's going to happen. Well, you can see we've we've reduced the number of routes, reduced the turnover, so so we're kind of moving in that direction. But as but when it's over a period of time, we can you know we're grad when you make adjustments gradually, then it's not you know. The same kind of pain as if you, if we went from just went out and hired twenty drivers, we'd have to deal with how we're going to pay, uh, but we're not able to do that anyhow. So that's not a, an immediate concern, um, but we are aware of of um, there's a financial element to how we operate transportation, so we have to we have to be sensitive to that. So, so are you are you saying that we are, we're gradually trying to reach those ideal levels? Well, it's not a, it's not a choice because there's not enough applicants out there to, to do anything other than gradual, and um, and 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 we've continued to you know to really to hire as many dri qualified drivers as we can, and so, um, but that but the end result is it's a gradual process, which financially that's helpful, and um, um, so our goal, as Gary said, is to to eliminate the double routes first and and then we would look to the um, likely the next we would look to the walk zones not whether we'd have them or not have them but it would be more likely they might shrink and because we know that and, and we call them no bus zones because we try to stay from you know walking because we're not saying that it's okay for your kindergarten kid to walk a mile and a half to school uh, we're saying we don't have the wherewithal to provide you a bus and um, Thus, the no bus zone. 
Um, and and so every family has different circumstances. But at the end of the day, it's, it's your child. We're not trying to tell you what's safe for your child to do. We're, we're just saying we're not able to put a bus in there. Even if, even if we wanted to, we just don't have. But, so we don't have like 25 or 30 requisitions open, but we have some number, like five or two or... Or you, you mean open position? Yeah. Like yeah. Let's well, I, I think it's fair to say that we're we're just constantly hiring. So in this case, it's not a matter of we're trying to fill, you know, ten jobs um, because the the number is big enough, if, and it's gradual enough process that if we find, you know, we're, our goal is to get as many in training as possible, and then and have as many of them turn into you know, full time bus drivers. And so uh, we're not we don't. <laughs> Even consider a point where we'll, we won't need anymore. <laughs> so, so it's in this area, it's been short enough for long enough that that, that we just continue to focus on hiring as many as, as we can. Yeah, it's a pleasant problem we haven't uh, we haven't had the the opportunity to run into yet. It's pricing ourselves, you know, to that point. But it's uh, yeah, like Roger said, we don't have oh we've got five vacancies we're going to hire to fill them. It's it's very organic. It's hey, we're gonna we're gonna front load as many folks as we can into training, and knowing full well that throughout that four to six week time period, we're gonna lose at least X number of drivers. And keep in mind, we're not talking about just resignations either. I mentioned that our our average driver age is roughly 65, so with that often comes replacement parts that need to come along. And so you know we got folks that will go out for surgeries and they need to get a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement, hip replacement, that kind of thing. And so those can be longer periods of time that they're out and we need to have, you know, sub drivers who can fill in during that time frame too. So it's not always just resignations. Sometimes there are a, a lot more uh, spots that need to be filled than, than what resignations would indicate. All right. Thank you. I just have Jenny. Yep, all right. I just wanted to say kudos to you and your team. And I had a question on the, the slide prior to this one. I just wondered what the the non-CDL vehicles, um, yeah. what, what are those? So non-CDL vehicles, um, there are some districts who have invested in uh, either small, uh, like your white activity buses or um, SUVs or uh, even in some cases the small yellow buses as long as they are less than 15 passengers. Um, you would not technically have to have a CDL in order to operate it, but that driver still would have to have an Indiana yellow card. So they still have to go through all of the certification pieces, which is slide three, uh, of step three of that process I showed you. Um, they just wouldn't necessarily have to do the CDL portion of it. So what we find is we still run into the same problems. Um, there's, there's, as far as interest, uh, I've got a, a handful of people right now of staff members who are IAs in the building and they're also considered non-CDL drivers for us, and they utilize our smaller activity buses to transport kiddos who need like a one-on-one -on -one transport. Um, so we've been able to leverage them for those kind of special use cases, but in terms of just you know having a vast fleet of, of smaller vehicles, um, it, we just we haven't been able to find that interest. So we're really uh, we're really approaching it from the perspective of if we can get somebody over the fear of the commercial vehicle and its size. Um, then, then you can do that same job, but you know we'll, we'll we'll get a lot more bang for our buck, so to speak. You can transport 50 kids, uh, elementary, 50 middle school, 50 high school, rather than you know two here, two there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Right. This was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Our next report, Mr. McMichael, will present the monthly financial update. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, well, we're two months in, and um, we're uh, right where I would have projected that we would be. Um, you can see um, in our this year for our education operating and operating referendum and rainy day funds that um, it, we're our ending cash balances, which is one of the things that we look at very closely and keep a very close eye on. Uh, we ended the month at 14.7 million, and you'll see in a minute here, and I mentioned this last time, but last year um, it was 8.3 million. And so, but if you, there's two major things that are affecting that. First, 
um, we transferred two and a half million dollars into the rainy day fund, and you'll, you'll also see from the operations fund. You'll see you'll see that reflected when we get to the operations fund. So that's if you factor in the the transfer, and then as significantly, if, well, more significantly, um, this year, this year we are we are moving seventeen over seventeen million dollars um, of expenses we moved out of the re referendum fund. Um, into the rain or operations fund, and but then the money, which comes into the education fund, will will be transferred twice a year, June and December, um, because we want we want a true kind of a true up uh, for the June 30th balance and the December 31st balance. So if you factor those in, we're we're still ahead, which we should be, be because as are, you know, we're we're seven eight or probably eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. If you net that out, we're still about eight hundred more. Than we were a year ago, which we need to be because we operate on it. We look at our balances as a percentage. So as the budget goes up, you know the dollars go up. So and if we're going to keep you know the same percentage or whatever, so so all of that is uh, in accordance with our financial goals and plans. And, and uh, so in that regard, we're we're right on target with the with. Uh, Okay, so in the operations fund, same thing. Now here we're two point five million dollars in the negative. That's because we have expenses here, but our revenue, um, virtually all of it, is coming from property tax. So we, we receive that twice a year, and so that always starts, continues to get low, and then then it comes back up when we get the tax draw. And again, you can see that last uh, last year. Um, it was a negative 300,000, so a couple million dollars difference, and that's for the two reasons that I explained in terms of the transfer and the and of funds as well as the transfer of from this fund to the rainy day fund. So with that, I think I'll respond to questions that you might have. You can see here, well, the last thing would be the rainy day fund. We have, we're running at four point, um, almost 4.7 million, um, and we plan that's a planned intent to increase this over time, uh, which will then result in, in a increased uh, cash balance, which is another goal that we have. We've had a minimum of 8% for years. Um, we'd like to get it closer to 12 than 8. And so we're moving, we've been moving in a positive direction in that regard. So with that, I'll respond to questions if you have. Uh, we had a little discussion I've had before on the, the rainy day fund that <clears throat> we're seeing a, uh, a program expense that has a, uh, a one-time amount that's spread out over a number of months. Perhaps you could share some yeah, details yes. on that. Yes. Um, the rainy day fund is intended for just what the name implies. It's if you have a rainy day. And so something very unexpected. That's the, the primary focus. If you have something very unexpected, um, you've got some cash reserves. Um, that, that can get you through, hopefully, until, until something changes. Um, but for, so for sure, in Carmel at least, um, we absolutely look at rainy day fund as, as non-recurring expense. If, you know, if you have that rainy day, uh, because it's been an, it's an accumulated balance, so it'd be like you know living off your savings account. If you lose your job, you can do that until it runs out. But um, but we don't intend to to charge off recurring expenses like salary and benefits, for example, uh, to a rainy day fund. In this case, it was not, um, uh, you know, I, it wasn't a surprise where we, we chose to use rainy day funds to, to uh, pay for the transition to our, our new evaluation system for, for uh, teachers. And, and it's over a period of a few years. Amy could be more specific. But, but uh, here we, we elected to, to pay that from the rainy day fund. It's, it wasn't like an emergency, um, but it does meet that standard of, of a one-time expense. And uh, whereas the education fund, for example, is almost entirely recurring expenses because it's salary and benefits and of our staff. And so, so we could have, uh, I have to stop because they, they changed the use of the education fund from what it used to be the general fund. But, for sure, this would have either could have either been paid from the could have been paid from the operations fund, but then we're transferring money 
you know, from their operations fund to the rainy day fund. So, we, you know, if we if we use that, then it would all things equal be less money that, that we'd be able to transfer over to the rainy day fund. So, so that's why we we just made a conscious decision to charge it there. We didn't give it a you know a ton of thought because um, financially it doesn't really didn't really matter. Yeah. So what we're seeing in these two months of the sixteen thousand five hundred that that will run its course. Yes, I think the total amount over a period of, of what two or three three years is about two hundred twenty thousand dollars, and we've paid probably a majority of that at this point. But because we're we're more than halfway through it, um, so so that'll continue un until we um, get get to the end, end of the three years. All right, thank you very much, Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Our next report, uh, Mrs. Browning will present the legislative update. Yeah, so um, I had something nicely written up, and now I can't find it. So um, I'm going to bear with me, and I'm going to call an audible also to Dr. B to help me. Um, so get ready. The biggest thing I wanted to follow up with is on state bill, um, Senate bill number one regarding reading um, skills. This was a big priority for the legislative this year. Um, it, they did, it did pass, it was signed by the governor. Most of the laws were signed by the governor around mid-March. Um, it does state that if a third grader does not pass, I read that they can be held back. Um, but what I am happy about is there's a lot of things added also into the bill that does some more stuff before third grade. So I think Carmel Clay Schools is doing a lot of these things already. But I do like that they added more provisions for you need to catch this before third grade when we're having to hold students back. Um, so that has been signed by the governor or signed by the governor on March 11th. So that was one of the, the bigger things that I know that we were watching. As far as our legislative priorities go, um, quite a few of the things that we were really hoping would come up in this legislative session did not. Um, but we'll continue to adapt and we make um, next year's legislative priorities. We'll continue to tackle those things also. Dr. B, anything to add specifically? Uh, the only thing I would add was uh, uh, working off of Gary's uh, presentation, there was uh, legislation on stop arm violations that really put more teeth into it and uh, across the state, but and that almost made it to the finish line, then it was voted down. So uh, I'm sure that uh, that'll come back up again, but uh, I think Gary did work on that some, but uh, unfortunately didn't make it across the finish line. Um, if there's, I'll kind of, once I do find my document, um, if there's anything particular, I'll make sure I email you guys and let you know about that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Our last report this evening is the superintendent's report, report from Dr. Beresford. All right, thank you. Um, really appreciate Gary's presentation tonight. Um, just to give you a little um, perspective, um, for us to hire over 30 bus drivers two years in a row is like a new track record. Um, I've been in the business over 40 years, and we've never been able to hire that many bus, bus drivers in, in bigger districts than this one. Um, so uh, that was pretty phenomenal, and I think a lot of that was because uh, Gary worked very closely with Dr. Ostrike and Dr. Herrera, and uh, they were doing about as many creative things as you could think of to, uh, to get people interested in, in driving a bus. And... Uh, so uh, tonight's uh, presentation, I thought was very, uh, you know, very enlightening. And he's given that presentation for our PTO presidents and uh, to kind of lay, get the landscape down there uh, because we will always be constantly um, trying to hire bus drivers. Again, they will constantly re-retire, and it just kind of keeps cycling that way. Um, it really has been a pretty impressive thing when the great resignation uh, after the pandemic hit to be able to recover to breaking even. And uh, and I'm hoping that we can get rid of the double routes uh, sooner than later, because uh, that will be the next milestone, and then we, we'll go from there. And uh, for the public out there, um, I didn't see you guys clamoring about you know wanting to sign up to be a bus driver, but um, the uh, it is a great, uh, you really become a part of the families that you transport. Uh, I mean, they, they get uh, Christmas time, the gift cards flow freely, and uh, and uh, the the sweets and that sort of thing. Uh, I even had a student one time where they were passing on the football jerseys, and I always had a kind of a tradition of saying, "Hey, why did you pick that number?" And uh, I think the kid was 54, and I was thinking it was Brian Erlacher for the Bears, and he said, "That's my bus number." 
And I said, are you going to tell your bus driver that? And he goes, yep, that's why I picked it. And uh, so, uh, you know, you really do get some very pretty special uh, relationships. And uh, it's more than just a job. And uh, I think he did a good job describing that uh, you've you got to be a person that really wants to, to serve families and serve kids. And, uh, and it's pretty special. And the last thing I'll say about it is that, you know, you could drive your routes, go play golf, and then drive your routes again. And you're thinking in the winter. You could drive your routes, you could go bowling, and then you could drive your routes. So there is a lot of open space in the middle, and, uh, and it really it's a delightful little community of drivers, and uh, it's, it's pretty special. So uh, that's my plug, always for, for Gary there. Um, spring sports are kicking off, and, uh, and uh, we actually, I think the home opener was tonight at Hartman Field. And uh, so all that, that's starting up, and after spring break, it'll be a fast, fast track to the, uh, to the end of the year. Uh, I wanted to report to you that uh, I watched the Tech Hounds um, compete on Saturday in Plainfield as a regional, and uh, we had uh, the first the uh, first round they went through where they were dominant, and uh, in the second round um, in this competition, the first like 30 seconds of it, the the robot has to work by itself, so the the kids all step back behind a line, and and this. The robot goes and sucks up these little rings and shoots them into the, we saw them here at our workshop. And uh, as soon as it did that, uh, it died in the second round. And so they got like maybe four points in the second round, which for that regional, it just pretty much buries you. And so uh, I kind of went around going, well, too bad for the tech hounds. And then I get a text, uh, they won. They made one of the greatest comebacks in robotics history, I think. Uh, <laughs> to be the regional champion, so they'll be moving on now to the state competition, hopefully on to the Worlds, but, uh, but wow, what a comeback. And uh, I didn't really haven't found out what happened, but, uh, but it was uh, pretty amazing. The other thing that happened at Lucas Oil Stadium is there were 300 robotics teams that competed, including a bunch of our elementary and middle school teams. Uh, the, um, the results of that aren't out yet, and so uh, we'll, we're supposed to find out this week, uh, you know, how many are going to go to Worlds, but it's a uh, uh, we had a, you know, it's kind of cool coming off of our work session where we saw all the robots here. Uh, uh, watch the video if you missed it. It's just pretty cool. And uh, so all of those kids were working out down there, and so that was good. I also want to report that our Cyber Patriots, uh, which is our team of um, uh, basically what they are is they're like uh, the equivalent of like the the defense of, of computer systems. So uh, they're the ones that are kind of figure out who's trying to hack us, who's trying to, to, to fish us, all the different uh, pieces of security in the technology world. And uh, so uh, as a team, they placed first in the nation in the Boeing Cyber Physical Systems Challenge. So what they do is they make these simulations of people attacking uh, technological systems, and then they find them and stop them. And, uh, so uh, this is the second year they've qualified for nationals. And to qualify for nationals in this competition, you have to be in the top 12 of more than three, around 3,000, or maybe just uh, almost 3,000 teams across the country. So uh, Kerry Anderson is the uh, coach of the Cyber Patriots, and, uh, and they just do a phenomenal job. And uh, you want to be friends with those guys because they can really uh, uh, take care of you. Uh, I want to do a, a big uh, kudos and congratulations to our former assistant uh, athletic director, Bruce Wolf. Uh, Bruce served here for years and years and just a phenomenal human being. He was really one of the guys that was on the ground floor of starting the uh, unified sports and, and uh, having our, uh, our teams work with kids with disabilities and uh, just a really special person. And Dr. Brian Gray, who is another uh, CCS, CHS alum, and uh, this is chosen by students uh, to be put into the Carmel High School Alumni Hall of Fame. And uh, they do that based on criteria. And a lot, most of the criteria is what good things you've done for humanity. And so, uh, so congratulations to them. And they'll be uh, honored here pretty soon here in the spring. I um, wanted to get the word out to the community that we, on April the 10th, right here in the PMR from 5 to 7 PM, we're going to host the Community Preview Open House. Uh, and this is for um, educational materials adoption. So we're going to have K-5 literacy um, in uh, grades 6 through 8 and grades 9 through 12 science uh, uh, materials uh, that will be chosen for this next uh, adoption cycle. So uh, all these materials are from the Indiana Department of Education um, list of recommended um, 
pieces, but I wanted to get that word out on April 10th. Uh, you can come in and uh, if you want to nerd out on some textbooks and some, uh, some educational stuff for those uh, subjects, it's, it's going to be a great night. Uh, then my bell ringer. Uh, I just wanted to bring uh, your attention to just the amazing relationship that we have with our city. Uh, um, I attended a tour of Carmel High School with Mayor Finkham and, uh, and Principal Ferris uh, last week, and it was a pretty special day, uh, not only because the mayor came to town, so he came to uh, Carmel High School, but also because uh, we have a sister city in Japan, and every other year uh, some students will come here and then we'll send students over there. And uh, so we had all, all these kids from our sister city in Japan, and then they have a, a student who's like their tour guide and, uh, take, and keeps with them. And so we got to visit with a lot of the kids from, um, from Japan, and, uh, and uh, we were able to greet them. And then also uh, we toured the, uh, our CTE part of the building, which is our career technical education. So we were in the, a lot of our uh, building trades, our, uh, a little bit of our robotics are still in there too. Uh, in the car, uh, you know, the car mechanics, you know, area and that sort of thing. Then we also went to uh, our DECA classrooms, and the mayor got to see about, you know, it's all our business ed classes, and that was pretty special. And he got she got to meet with uh, some students because the students there, and we we're taking like 97 kids to nationals in DECA this year, and uh, so they were kind of the leadership of DECA was they were meeting, so she got to experience that a little bit. Uh, then the uh, the ambassadors uh, were doing some of their songs from their competitive show choir for the Japanese students, so they got to catch a little bit of that. So, uh, you know, I was really, it was pretty nice to be the superintendent with the mayor when the kids were just doing all these fantastically cool things. And uh, the fun part, though, is several of our students would come up and say, uh, are you Mayor Finkham? And she's like, yeah, I am. Can I get a picture with you? And so they're getting their picture taken with her. And uh, my favorite story was this girl came up. She goes, I just think it's great that you're the mayor. You are a girl boss. You're just a girl boss. And, uh, and Mayor Finkham goes, thank you very much. And, uh, so uh, it, was, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, but wait, that's not all. Um, today, um, uh, you know, Lieutenant Miller back there, along with uh, David Woodward, we met with our brand new uh, police chief. Um, and uh, Drake Sterling, so we met with the new chief, and uh, and uh, we got to tour the, uh, the the new police department's been kind of remodeled and uh, really fantastic facility. Now they actually added a court to it too, so the Carmel Court is there. Uh, but uh, he's he was, this evening at Hartman Field. He threw the opening pitch uh, for uh, for us here at Carmel Clay Schools and. Uh, I think his son was the bat boy as well uh, throughout the throughout the game. He's a, he's a baseballer. So uh, uh, anyhow, I just wanted to just you know we're fortunate that we have such a great relationship with our, our city. We've got great communications and connections, and uh, and it really is a whole community piece. Uh, you know, with this the city and you know the schools. Uh, finally, I just want to wish everybody a safe and happy spring break, and a reminder that we are not coming to school on Monday. Because there's some, what is it that's happening? It's like uh, some, something like, uh, no, the solar eclipse uh, with total darkness here in Carmel, Indiana. Uh, it's going to be that Monday, so uh, and then we'll be coming back on that Tuesday. So just a reminder about that. But uh, wishing everybody a happy and safe spring break. Of course, after we get in three more hard days of work, and then uh, we'll go from there. So that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. And a reminder, as Dr. B said, uh, there are three more days of school. Our, you know, our original calendar had uh, the students off on Friday. However, that day was switched to uh, April 8th to avoid being in school during the eclipse. Um, so the spring break starts next Monday, April 1st, and is through April 8th. Um, our next school board meeting is at Clay Middle School. So that will not take place here. It will, we will be at Clay Middle School on Monday, April 15th. And then our following board meeting after that is Monday, May 13th, back here in this building. Can I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? And a second? Second. <laughs> meeting adjourned. <laughs>